she is, she with some other great members of her team and whatnot have organized this whole effort down there. And it really is overwhelming. And can I just encourage you enough, uh, not just with this particular issue, but with all issues, maybe even the particular year it is with political issues. Actually, I know currently there's a vote happening right now. Um, uh, you can actually early vote uh, in our county. I would encourage you to do that. I always tell the church here, if you're visiting with us, please do get nervous. But I would say to you that uh, I'll tell you exactly how to vote. Pray, read your Bible, and then vote accordingly. How's that? No giggles? Good gracious. People get normally get nervous, you tell them how to vote. But uh, as followers of Christ, it's not our vote, it's his vote, right? Because everything belongs to him. So I'm just saying pray and read your Bible and vote accordingly and do that. But all of these things are places where we get to be involved. And when you're on sometimes Facebook, some other things, there's a lot of information that's put out there by whoever, wherever. I would encourage you to talk to people who have feet on the ground. I would encourage you to talk to people who have been there and people who know. Don't uh, just get all your news from Facebook. How's that? Is that okay? Are y'all all right? This is a good day. It's a good day, church. Well, look, we're going to talk about church today. Aren't you excited? All right, who's going to be honest and tell me they have an opinion about church? Anybody? Everybody, please. You're here. You have an opinion about church right? Actually, there's some people that aren't here because they have an opinion about church, right? Um, that's actually just true for all of us. We all, we all have opinions about church. And we've been in this uh, message uh, series here called Simple, and we've talked a lot about us as individual followers of Christ. Um, the simple things that Jesus laid out for us, that if we want the life of Jesus, then we not just say we believe in Jesus, but we begin to follow Jesus, which means we're going to adopt his lifestyle, Amen. right? Well, that's true for us as individual followers of Christ, but as individual followers of Christ, we are also collectively together his body, his family, the church. And we're going to talk about some things today related to things that are things the church should be doing in our process that God's called us to. And sometimes we miss those things because our preferences about church, things like, it's too hot, it's too cold in the sanctuary. You pray for your sound guys, because our thermostats are back there in the sound booth, and often people will visit the sound booth not to say hello, but they'll say, can you turn the air up? Can you turn the air down? It's too loud, it's too quiet, I can't hear so-and-so. Opinions about church, right? The leadership should be doing this. The leadership shouldn't be doing that. You have opinions about the people you sit next to. You have opinions about people that you won't sit next to, right? The truth is we all do that. Now listen, some of these opinions about church and things we think the church should be doing are legitimate. Some of these concerns that we have are legitimate concerns. Some of them might, I would suggest, come from our preferences, our background in church, the way it's just our experience of what we've known. Maybe some of it comes from a consumer mentality that we tend to have here in the States, that we actually come to church so that we receive things that we want to receive. So it kind of begs the question, what should church look like? What matters in church? What, what matters most in church? And I just want to submit to you that one thing is for sure. None of our churches today, particularly in the United States, look like church 2,000 years ago. They don't. They couldn't turn the thermostat up or down. <laughs> they did not have multiple choice seating like we have here at Liberty where we have traditional and non-traditional seating. Um, right? They didn't have cushy chairs, children's programs. Youth programs, they didn't have those things. Methods throughout the years of church have changed. And actually, you're like, yeah, there's all those denominations. We shouldn't have all those denominations, all these different churches. Well, actually, we're in good company because in the first century, there were denominations then. Do you know that? People are like, well, you get back to the original church. Well, there was the Jewish church in Jerusalem, and then there was the Gentile churches. 
and multiple Gentile churches. And they all operated a little differently and had different backgrounds and those kinds of things. So methods are going to change over the years. It's the message that must not and cannot change. It's the message that can't change. But there are also, in addition to that, some essential core things. I would call them fundamentals, to use a basketball reference. We are, as I mentioned in the first service, praying for the Tar Heels right now. Um, there are fundamentals, okay? There are fundamentals that are laid out for us when we look at the first church in Scripture that should be woven through all churches regardless of our methods. It's just like if you want the life of Jesus, then you're not, when you follow him, you also adopt the lifestyle, the practices of Jesus, so we can become like Jesus. He does his work in us, right? Disciples, one for those who follow and become like. Then we as the body of Christ in church need to look back at the first church and say, what are the core things in church that need to be woven through everything that we do? So I would say that the message today, if I would title a message, because I don't typically title messages, but we could call this first things first. First things first. So instead of opinion or preferences or consumer mentality, we want to look at Scripture, look at the Bible, and see what the Bible says about what's most important and what we should be simply doing. Are we okay? So if you will crack open this amazing book and put a finger in the first chapter of Acts, we're going to get back to it in just a minute. And what we're going to see here in the book of Acts, I've said something like this before from up here, but this is going to be the first response of the first church leaders to the great commission given by Jesus, Matthew 28, we've already read today, Katie was talking about, and the first outpouring of the Holy Spirit, then the subsequent response of those who heard that first preaching of the gospel. It's the first thing. It's church in its brand new infant form, in its purest form. Because I want you to think, in Acts chapter 1, when the first church was born on the first day, the people who showed up that day did not come from a split in a church down the street. They didn't show up at the first church because, well, they've got the best children's program in town. Or they've got multiple Bible studies we can choose from. Or I really like the way that guy preaches, right? They had no preconceived ideas. They had no context of church because there had never been one before. And see, we kind of miss all the things that we kind of bring to church and then we project onto church. These folks had none of that. What they had that day was a response to Jesus from the preaching of the gospel and a conviction of the Holy Spirit that transformed their hearts. That's all that they brought. And so what we see following there is the natural, pure, spirit-led, spirit-powerful response to what God had done. It's a brand new thing in its purest form. I believe that what we're going to see here in the first church, I'm going to lay a few things out for you today, are the pillars, practices, the core practices that we should be doing. And I believe that our commitment to these things absolutely puts us in position to encounter Jesus, to grow, to experience true revival. And it's the thing that the world is really longing to see from the church. Not all this other stuff, not gimmicks, not fluff, not even necessarily thermostats, but the stuff that really transforms their hearts and lives. So before we hit um, Acts chapter 1 to look at these four things, I just want to give you from Jesus two things about the coming of the church. Are we okay? So I know you still got your finger in Acts. Over in Matthew chapter 16, we have one of my favorite accounts in Scripture. When I went to uh, Israel um, uh, a year or so ago, this was the place that was on my bucket list. I wanted to go to Caesarea Philippi where this event took place. All right, and this is what it says starting in verse 13. Now, when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? 
Simon Peter replies, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, there's just a couple things real quick getting this I want you to catch here. The church is built by Jesus on Jesus and it's about Jesus. All right? So Jesus asked the question that every single one of us has to answer. Who do you say Jesus is? Because as they were saying here when they first replied, is that there's all kinds of opinions out there about Jesus. Opinions. Right? And they're like one of the prophets or John the Baptist or somebody. We've kind of heard about this guy. Well, today it's no different. People have all kinds of opinions. Some people are like, he's fake. He's just a fake guy in a fictional book. Wasn't real. Some people say, well, he's a nice guy. You know, some people say he's God. There's all kinds of opinions. But Jesus drills down on the disciples here and says, look, you can't do relationship with me on the opinions of other people. You have to answer that question for you. So Peter answers this question and says that you are... You are the Lord. You're the Messiah. You are the Son of God. And Jesus says, right there, upon that confession, I'm going to build my church. All right? So we, the body of Christ, those who are followers of Christ, the Bible has a couple of references about us, that we are members of God's whole household. The Bible also says that we are living stones that build or make up the whole house of God. So we're all, but Jesus is, the Bible says, the chief cornerstone. Now, in old time construction, a cornerstone was a part of the foundation that holds the whole thing up. And that's Jesus. If you pull that out, the whole thing falls down. All right? So the church belongs to Jesus. He's building it. It's his church. Not my church, not your church. It's his church. But we get to be members of it by this confession, by being followers of Christ. And he's going to build his church. It is about him. It's built on him. It's about Jesus. The second thing I want you to look at about the church and the birth of the church is over in Matthew 28, real familiar here, the Great Commission. Jesus has died for the sins of the world. He's risen again, kicking death, hell, and the grave in the teeth. And then for about 40 days, he's been teaching um, and pouring into his disciples. And now he's getting ready to leave and ascend back to heaven and then pour out the Holy Spirit for the birth of the church. Okay, that's what's about to take place. But before he goes, he has this exchange. He says uh, in Matthew 28, verse 18, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So the first thing is the church is Jesus's, is built on Jesus, is about Jesus. The second thing here related to the church is this is the mission of the church and the way the mission gets done. Okay? So the second thing here, Matthew 28, is the mission of the church and how it gets done. What's the mission of the church? It is to make disciples. The mission of the church is to make disciples. Your job and my job, all of our job, those of us that are followers of Christ, is to go and make other followers of Christ to disciple them, not to win converts, to get people to raise a hand and say, I believe, and then we walk away. No, it's to walk with them, to disciple them. Discipleship is a process where one pours life into another. Are we okay? All right. To make disciples of who? It says nations there. The word nations there is the word ethnos. It means people. It says to go, into, go to all people groups. It says to go to all people and make disciples. How do you do that? It says, well, you do this by baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to teach them to obey everything that Jesus commanded them, the disciples. Which means everything that the disciples teach is things that we need to be doing because of that command right there, because it says, teach them, that's us, to obey everything that Jesus commanded them. You follow me? Yes. Are we good? All right. So the baptizing thing is a big word, not because it has a lot of letters in it. It's a big word because it contains a lot. The word baptizing there implies the whole shebang, which means we're going to live a life 
that, it, that, that shows the gospel, that we live out the good news of Jesus, that we share the good news of Jesus, that we share our testimonies, that we lead people into meeting Jesus, right? And then the expression of people meeting Jesus, the public expression of them meeting Jesus is to be baptized. If you've met Jesus and you've not been baptized, that is your next step. Why? Because that's how it is in the Bible. Baptism doesn't, we don't say that baptism saves. Baptism is that declaration. It is the exclamation point on the end of the sentence that declares to everyone that there has been an inward change in my life and I'm telling everybody that I'm a member of God's household, that I've identified with him in death and I've been raised to new life. And what we see in the Bible is people got pretty doggone immediately baptized. And so if you were baptized, not of your own choosing as a young person, of your own declaration, you know, or if you've never been baptized, that is your next step if you're a follower of Christ. Why? Because that's what it says, right? I'm kind of a big proponent of mystery. I can't explain to you all the whys. I'm just saying that's what it says, so let's just do it. Is that all right? It's simple, okay? All right. The second thing is to teach them to obey everything that Jesus commanded. That implies practices putting into practice the life of Jesus, okay? So, church is built on Jesus, belongs to Jesus, it's his church, and we have a mission and the method to get it done. Are we okay? So that is the lead up to Acts chapter 1. If you look with me here, that there are four core foundations or pillars or practices that I want you to see here. That regardless of what we do as a church, these things should be woven through all of it. If they're not, it's fluffy. And we don't want the fluff, we want the real stuff. Amen. Right? We don't want to say catchy things so they can be put on bumper stickers. We want what the Word of God says because the Word of God is life and power to us. Right? Okay? All right. So in Acts chapter 1, Jesus has said, Go into all the world. Well, right over in Acts 1 he says, But wait! Why? Because if you go without his power, you're going to get your brains beat out. Right? So he wants them to go and receive his power to wait and receive the promise of the Holy Spirit so that they can be the church. But there's something that transpires prior to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the top of Acts chapter 2. And that is the disciples' obedience. He said go, and so they went. So they obeyed, and it says in verse 14 here, it says, all of these, and it's the remaining disciples and followers of Jesus, which weren't a lot at this point, because they've been scattered. It says, all these were gathered in one accord and were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women Mary and the mother of Jesus and his brothers. So what we have here is they obey and go and gather in the upper room. The New International Version, which is what is in most all of your seats out there, it says that they were all together in constant prayer, verse 14. The New American Standard Bible says they were all with one mind and constantly in prayer. The King James Version says they were in one accord. The NLT, that's not a car, that means together, okay. And the NLT says they were constantly united in prayer. So the first thing that's a pillar for the church of Jesus Christ is unity. A unified church is a powerful church. Well, I told you the other week in John chapter 17 when Jesus prays, Jesus' high priestly prayer is what it's called, is listed there, and he prays for all believers. That means you who follow Jesus out here, that prayer contains you. And Jesus has a prayer request in that prayer in John 17. And his prayer request, when Jesus, who is Jesus, can ask for anything he wants, and I think his prayers get answered, right? He prays that we would be one. He prays that we would be united. That was Jesus' prayer. These guys were of one heart and one mind together. Then what takes place? Then the power of God is poured out. John chapter 17 records uh, Jesus' prayer, tells us to be one. But what do we see today in a lot of our churches? We see people divided and not united about church, around church, and even in churches. 
People divided over the types of music or particular things that are preached or, you know, side issues. And people are divided about who did what when and what should be happening. And people get divided over these things. No wonder we might not be seeing revival in our land today. No wonder we might not be seeing some of the breakthroughs that we're looking for. Because again, the power move of God came after they were unified together in that one place. Unity is not uniformity. Doesn't mean all those guys were the same. It's the message that doesn't change. We're not unified around our style of church. We're, uni- we're not Calvinists, Baptists, Arminians, Methodists, whatever, right? The church is unified around Christ. It's his church. It's about him. It's not particular camps. It's about Jesus. Okay? Now, you have an eclectic bunch in this house. I was mentioning to the first service that I was somewhat raised a little bit Methodist, but mostly in a charismatic home. I went to a Presbyterian college, then to a Pentecostal holiness college, then I youth pastor in a Baptist church for a while, and then eventually wound up here. All right, Heinz 57, 57 varieties. Dad, Pastor John, is a retired Methodist minister. We had a powerful encounter with the Holy Spirit in 74. Pastor Jamie uh, had been uh, at a Baptist seminary and served in a Presbyterian church for a while. And he had an encounter with the Holy Spirit, but that's his background. You got Pastor Catherine. I missed the first half in the first service. She actually was uh, uh, raised in the Church of Christ. And then was Methodist uh, for about 21 years. I mean, we're a wide variety bunch here. I was telling one of our elders uh, this past week that I believe liberty is beautifully generic. And what I mean by that is, if you come from a traditional church background, one, we have seating for you, right? We have pews, right? But, but also, listen, if you really want to know, if you have to know, the reason the pews are still in the house is because it's actually a requirement by the fire marshal because the angled floor and they have to be bolted to the ground. So. But I like them. I think the pews are awesome. And, uh, but if you come from a traditional background here, You come into liberty, and while you may look across the room and go, okay, the flags are weird, right? You go, you know, they're a little wild in worship. But you come from a place where you heard the Bible really taught and preached and dug into, and you're going, wow, okay, that's kind of home for me, right? And we have verse-by-verse Bible studies and all those things going on. You come from a wild worship and charismatic background. You come into liberty, you go, wow, there's freedom in the house. Maybe the sermons get a little long, but there's freedom in the house. And whatever your background is, there's this thread here that we fight for. Now, we don't do everything right. We're, we're messy around here sometimes. We don't get everything right. But we want this thing to be built on Jesus. It's not about the particular background or the bent. It's about the gospel. Right? We just want what it says. And so it just winds up being home to a pretty eclectic bunch, and I think that just looks like the kingdom to me. And I'm thankful, before anybody gets upset with me, and I'll move on, for all the varied, beautiful backgrounds that denominations bring, where our Baptist friends and their real strong commitment to evangelism and scripture memorization, our Presbyterian friends who have a strong commitment and fight for the, for the scriptures to not be compromised, right? For the Methodist folks who brought to us systems of ministry and getting not paid staff, but lay people to lead ministries and to use their gifts. All the beautiful things that are brought to us through some of these very backgrounds. I just think we all need to be reminded that there aren't separate tables. There's just the table of the Lord, and we're all invited, right? And um, unity. Second thing, moving on as quick as I can today. Praise the Lord. All right. Look at verse 1 of chapter 2. Second thing here. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. 
And that sound that happens draws them all together and they come rushing to the house to hear what was going on. All right? What happens in that moment is the promise that Jesus made to them happened. The Holy Spirit was poured out and filled the apostles in that moment, the believers in that moment. And they, the church is born. The Holy Spirit was given to empower the believer to be the church. Now, I want us to look at a couple things here. When you surrender to your life to Christ, and we don't have a lot of time on this today, um, we did a series actually um, regarding the person and the work of the Holy Spirit this past summer that's actually online. I encourage you to go listen to it, to dig a little further. But it's, uh, um, when you surrender your life to Christ, all of God comes to reside in you. It's not like you get a little Jesus and you get some Holy Spirit later or something. Okay? He's one God. And when you surrender your life to Christ and he takes up residence on the throne of your heart, Okay, the king comes to live here. All of God comes. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But when we look all through the book of Acts, we see some interesting things. We see the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We see the filling, the coming upon, the anointing, the empowering of the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of mystery there. What's the deal? God's available to you in power. And he wants to empower you to be the church, not do weird things. People are afraid God's going to make me weird. I'm just like, well, if God's weird, let's be weird. The other option's pretty hot. Okay? So, right, what God offers us is good, and it's good gifts. The Apostle Paul even says to be continuously or daily filled. So it's not some event in the past. It's every day we need to surrender to the person of the Holy Spirit and his work in our life. I said this analogy sometimes. It was as if the spigot was turned on 2,000 years ago on the day of Pentecost. For those of you that may be from the north, it's the faucet. Um, We say spigot in the south. Um, And it's never been turned off. The key is that the Holy Spirit's role in our life is to empower us to be the church and fulfill the mission. In John chapters 14 through 16, the Holy, it says that the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth, that he testifies about Jesus, that he will comfort us, that he convicts of sin. You ever had that happen? You done something wrong and all of a sudden, like, oop, I blew it. It's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That he convicts of righteousness, that he's going to lead and guide you and tell you what's right, of the coming judgment, and that he reminds us of all that Jesus has said. In Romans chapter 12 and in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, that he has gifts to unfold in your life. He has roles for you to fulfill, things that God created for you to do. Gifts that he has for you that work in supernatural power through love for the common good. That the movement of the Holy Spirit and his gifts... All right? Again, just listen to that. Work in supernatural power, but through love, 1 Corinthians 13, and for the common good. Galatians chapter 5 says, he works to produce the nature of Jesus in us. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control, right? Those things. Are you there yet? I think he's still working on me too. So what happens is any moment when I surrender to the Lord and I obey, it creates a place where the Holy Spirit can fill. And then supernatural things can happen. The Holy Spirit was given to empower the church, to be the church, to fulfill the mission. So the second thing is the Holy Spirit. Unity, the Holy Spirit, the third thing is the gospel. Now, I want you to look here It's verses 14 through 41. A long stretch of scripture that contains the message that Peter preaches on that day when he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. Okay, we're going to come back to that in just a minute. But in verse 14, it says, Peter stood up and raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Okay, so the Holy Spirit has now filled Peter up. And he stands up in boldness to speak. Now, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, the noise was so loud that all these people, thousands of people, bum-rushed the house. So what it says, that people showed up. Now, I want you to remember, they are holed up in the town where Jesus was just recently crucified. Okay? And Christ followers are not popular. 
You, you following? And so when the Holy Spirit gets really noisy, I know the boys in the house go, ooh, he just outed us. Because they couldn't hide from being killed or arrested for being Christ followers anymore because the Holy Spirit was so loud, everybody showed up. Secondly, a large crowd of people that they did not know rushed the house. That's a pretty crazy scene. But then Peter stands up and raises his voice, and I just have to imagine that all the disciples in the room went, oh gosh, Peter. <laughs> right? Jumps out of boats, chops off ears, speaks out of turn, Peter. But this is not the same Peter anymore. He has been transformed by the filling of God's Spirit. And he goes on to speak eloquently and powerfully the good news of Jesus Christ to these people. And 3,000 people give their lives to Christ that day. The last line of his message is not your typical altar call in church where I said in the first service, say, after the service, our prayer team will be available to you. If you have any need in your life, if you please come, we'd be thrilled to pray with you today. Okay? His last line says this. In the NIV, it says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. In other words, you killed him. That's what Jesus says to him. But God made him Lord. So, what did, so the Holy Spirit then convicts and the people respond and they say, what do we got to do? We got to do something about that. What do we do? And Peter simply responds. Here's the latest book. You need to read this. Come to discipleship class so you can grow. No. Peter says, repent, be baptized, and you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. Simple. He didn't say, come to a class on baptism so we can explain it all to you before you do it. He just says, remember, no context, no church before this moment. They didn't know. Now, baptism would have been something they would have been familiar with somewhat in their area, but not from this context. He says, repent, be baptized, and you will be filled with the Holy Spirit. The bulk of this chapter, 14 through 41, is the gospel. Sometimes we make so much about the first few verses about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, or we make so much about the final verses about some discipleship practices, and we forget that the two-thirds of this chapter is the good news of Jesus Christ. The church is about Jesus. And it's built on Jesus. Acts 42 through 47. Some of you guys know this is a pet set of passages for me. The fourth thing here will be discipleship practices. And it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayers. And then they go on through the rest of the verses in the chapter, 43 through 47. And it just shows the supernatural things that begin to take place. People caring for people. Miracles taking place. People being encouraged. People finding community. So much love going on within the family because of the move of God that people daily are coming to Christ in that context. They devoted themselves. We did an entire message series on about being devoted in 2018, September of 2018, about being devoted to these things. The word devoted means to give your life to. They gave their lives to these practices. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. What is that? That's the word of God. Because we have the apostles' teaching written, written down right here. They devoted themselves to the word. They devoted themselves to fellowship. Fellowship? That's why we do small groups around this joint. That's why we encourage believers to do things together because you'll find community. It's where people get cared for. It's where people are held accountable. It's where people can grow. They devoted themselves to fellowship. They devoted themselves to communion or the breaking of bread is what that means. We do communion here on the second Sunday of every month, but many of you probably don't know because we just haven't said it much. Is right over here to my right is a basket. And in that basket is communion that you can take every Sunday. In our small groups, people take communion at times. We encourage it. Jesus said, do it as often as you get together. What is it? It is an act of worship to Jesus because of what he's done. Celebrating the death and resurrection of our Lord where we find eternal life. Acts of worship. They were devoted to it. What do we find today about worship? We find that people treat gathering together as optional. 
When the Apostle Paul says to do it all the more as the day of Jesus' return gets closer. He said do it all the more. And in this day and age, in our context, people are doing it less. And they think reading a Christian book or watching a video is church. It can be great and supplemental and encouraging in your growth in the Lord. But there are things that happen in this room when we gather together that do not happen anywhere else in the Christian journey. But people on average now come 1.8 or 1.9 times a month is the national average right now. And we actually fall kind of in the national average. If everybody that comes to Liberty showed up on one Sunday, we'd be in trouble. We track about 900 people that come at least once a month through these doors. What would happen if we got devoted to acts of worship? It's just convicting to me in my own life. What would happen? They were devoted to prayer. We spent all month talking about that in January. They were giving their lives to communion with God in prayer. Talking personally with Him, individually, quiet times, but corporately as a body. Four little things that we see in the first church. So I want to encourage you today, if you can, some of you, I know not everybody can. It'll be up on the website later. We've got our annual meeting after church today. It's not just about numbers and business stuff. It's where you can see woven throughout our church, we are committed to these practices. Children's ministry is just a program. They didn't have that in the first service. Youth ministry is just a program. They didn't have that in the first century. They didn't have worship pastor. You know, they didn't have all those different things. Okay? They didn't have a camp. Their lifestyle was camping for many of them, right? But woven through all these things that are just tools, they're just tools to where we can be unified, filled with the Spirit, living out and preaching the gospel, and devoted to these practices that produce the life of Christ in us. We're committed to making sure that all those things weave through all the areas of our church. Because if it's not, it's just stuff. And stuff doesn't save. Jesus saves. It's his church. So I want you to do this with me. If you'll stand, um, we're going to meet at 1230 following church. um, And you're welcome to stay if you can um, with that. I want us to have a response. I know that this is just a couple of minutes. If I can get the worship team to come. This is a couple of minutes after 12 for those of you that care. And... um, I want you to hang on with me for just a minute, if you will. And I want you to sing with me and us the first part of this this song here as a response to the Lord. I just want to invite you, not manipulate you, because you ain't got to, but invite you into a commitment today. And say, Lord, I want to devote to this. I was telling Dad last night, we were talking, and just even to, this is what I want to give my life to. I don't want to give my life to church busyness. I don't want to give my life to trendy church practices. I don't care if Liberty's ever known anywhere outside of Collington. Don't care. Don't care. And some of you travel a long ways to get here, and that's so awesome that you found home here. I mean, it's one of the greatest compliments we ever hear about Liberty is are the same, it's the same compliment with different words, which is, I feel loved there, or I feel at home. I encountered Christ there. Because that's what we want. Because that's the thing that matters. You hear me? And if you'll hang out around here, you're going to find a place where you can hear the word, a place where you can commune or worship God. You can find fellowship. You can find places to serve, places to pray. So this is just kind of a song of commitment today that I just want us to close together with, and I'll just dismiss you in a minute. But as we do this song, as we start singing, if the pastors and Alice and the prayer team and elders would come, they're going to be available up here if you need prayer. And then in just a minute, I'll dismiss this. But just sing this today as a commitment to the Lord.
I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. And I'm not here for blessings. Jesus, you don't owe. the song take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda I'm sorry when I forgot the chore this bridge together. I just want you and nothing else and nothing else nothing else will do. I just want you and nothing else nothing else nothing else Nothing else, and nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. I told the first service this morning that I believe that these messages that we've been preaching since January are the most important ones we've probably done in the life of this church in recent years. It is about getting back to what this is about. It's about Jesus. It's his church. That he gave you his own spirit, the Holy Spirit so that we could go and live this out in power and see the world changed. Let's just commit this year to make it about Jesus, to be the church. Amen? So as we let you go, I just want you to go out in power. If you need prayer, our crew is up here. They'll pray with you. All right? We're going to be meeting at 1230 if you've got the opportunity to stay. We love you guys. Go